Hello everyone. Welcome to Alpha One Canada's virtual education webinar. My name is Duncan Lam and I'll be your host. Today, we will be listening to Elizabeth Franke on the topic of music therapy for a better quality of life. Elizabeth is a music therapist who is based in Ottawa, Ontario. Before we begin, let me remind you that all attendees' microphones are automatically muted by the system. We'll provide you with instructions on how to ask questions before we get into the Q&A session, which is right after Elizabeth's presentation. Without further ado, I'll pass this over to Elizabeth. Hello, good evening, everyone. I am very pleased and honored to be doing this uh, tonight, this presentation. Um, before I go into the presentation itself, I just uh, wanted to uh, tell uh, a few things about myself, uh, my background. Um, like Duncan said, I am uh, in Ottawa. I have been here for now uh, five years. Uh, prior to that, I was living in um, Michigan where I did my training um, both in music therapy and in clinical psychology. And over there, while I was in Michigan, I was working mostly in patient psychiatry. I was working three days a week on the child and adolescent unit, and the rest of the week I would be working on the adult and geriatric um, unit. And also I did some work with uh, the Lutheran Homes of Michigan, and they provided services for um, older adults that uh, had different levels of functioning and uh, lived uh, either in an um, assisted living facility or in independent homes and they would get services in their homes. Like I said, I, I do have a background in music therapy and in clinical psychology. Uh, so the people that I work with mostly um, are people who have mental health issues and uh, some developmental uh, delays. And those are the people I work mostly with uh, nowadays. So uh, we can uh, go ahead and, and start this. Um, so what is music therapy? This is one definition amongst others. It's not the only one because music therapy can be defined in many different ways depending on who you work with and how you work as a music therapist because like any other therapeutic approach there are different branches of, of music therapy. So I like this one. Um, it's, it says it's an evidence-based profession um, in which uh, uh, people who have undergone uh, a university um, education, a minimum bachelor's degree, uh, that person can use music uh, in a planned and effective way to achieve goals that are not musical, but music is used to achieve those goals. And those different goals can be in a variety of different do domains. Um, like communication, learning, um, psychological, spiritual, motor, name it. You know, uh, music therapists can work with uh, ven very uh, varied uh, needs and populations. What I like to say um, about music therapy is that, like I mentioned, we're, we are working on non-musical goals and we use music and its elements to achieve those goals. Uh, we are not entertainers. Uh, we're not just going to show up and, and just play music uh, for people's entertainment. We're not engineers and we're not music teachers. Our goal is not to teach someone music or how to play an instrument or music theory or, or musicology, what have you. We're not teachers. Music therapists, what we do, uh, like any other um, health profession, um, before starting any intervention, we do an assessment. Uh, we have someone in front of us who presents with specific needs and uh, specific skills and based on that we conduct an assessment and in that assessment we derive some goals and objectives and if there is a parent or a caregiver involved uh, we do um, talk uh, with that person or the client his or her, her uh, herself and then 
we agree on what goals we can be working on. Of course, we always go with the person and the group members who are in front of us because music therapy does not only have to be one-on-one, -on -one, it can be conducted uh, as a group format as well. So we go with the people we have in front of us. We do not decide the music that we're going to play and have a set lesson plan. We can have a very good idea of the goals we're going to work on and have a few things uh, that we know have worked well, but we're always going to adapt it and change it in the moment with the people we have in front of us. Um, and very often when music therapists don't work in, in their private practice, they often work in a facility or in a school and they will work with the other professionals that are on the team and uh, that are involved with, that per, the, with the, the client and they work together to know what's going on, what's the progress and then we keep updating everybody else so they know. Like I said, when I was in uh, Michigan and working in patient psychiatry, every morning we would meet the whole team, the doctors, the nurses, the social workers, the occupational therapists, and we would all be sharing our, our, um, our information that we had on, on the patients, and that was definitely teamwork. So with music therapy, it's quite a, a younger, I would say, or immature but not immature in a not good uh, way of saying immature in the sense that it's still pretty young. Um, it's, it's a field that is getting talked about more and more. We see it more and more in the media. It got a lot of attention when, um, what, was she a governor in the United States, I want to say? I think she was a governor not a senator, but anyways, uh, Mrs. Gifford in the United States when she got shot and, and a lot of her rehabilitation in the hospital for speech rehab uh, with the music therapist who worked at the hospital. Um, so if we go into, um, you know, someone who lives with a chronic um, disease, uh, whether, you know, it's cancer or a brain injury, an acquired brain injury, a traumatic brain injury, um, and uh, people um, living with a chronic lung disease, it's, you know, it, it definitely has a side effects on, on your mood um, and your personality, and, and you get to the point sometimes where your mood can, can get pretty, pretty low, and, and it affects you, and you think, oh, wow, this thing is spinning me, I can't do or I don't want to do things because it's such a bother to just try to get out of here and et cetera, et cetera. So tonight what I, what I want to stress is that even though those symptoms or maybe not symptoms but episodes of feeling anxious or um, a little low or uh, depressed, you know, they're part of the journey, but there, there are ways that we can maybe target that and make the quality of life a little better than what it is. So I, I want to target more specifically um, maybe those times where you don't feel your best uh, in terms of, of your mood and uh, your affect and the way you want to be participating in life and also um, the anxiety that um, living with a chronic disease can bring. Uh, depression and anxiety, I would say 99% of the time go together one, uh, hand in hand. Uh, they, uh, most psychiatrists in the Western world will, you know, are trying to figure out if depression causes anxiety or is it anxiety that causes depression. But uh, they all agree on, well, they go hand in hand. So, you, like I said, it doesn't have to be clinical depression. You can have those times where you don't feel really, you know, up to do much. You want to isolate yourself. You're maybe not sleeping well or you're not very hungry and things like that. And sometimes, yeah, you just feel a little low and it's just, you know, sadness. And so all of that to say, whether it is clinical depression or, or it's a moment or a stretch that you're not feeling too great or super 
or anxious, uh, you can still do something about it. And um, you know, people, like I said earlier, they're thinking, oh, you know, why bother? I'm stuck with this. This is with me. And you know, sometimes it is addressed with uh, medication. And um, of course, I'm a believer in, in uh, medication, uh, but also research has shown over and over and over that what's most optimal for treatment of these things is, of course, you've got your medication, but therapy also. And uh, the side effects of the medication sometimes are, you know, in someone they're going to be um, quite present and in others not really noticed. So what happens also is, you know, when you're depressed and, and you start isolating yourself or you're anxious and you stop doing the things that, that, that are meaningful to you and that are important in your life, well then you start missing on things that are really what you are about and then you start losing gradually a part of yourself and then at some point people will say to me, I feel numb. I don't feel anything anymore. I don't care anymore. I, I, and, and it affects not only that person, but it affects everybody around them, their loved ones, their friends, their co-workers, etc. So there's definitely, you know, a need to address all of those manifestations of um, anxiety or depression um, to make life uh, enjoyable again and uh, meaningful, that you find meaningful again. So for music therapy, you know, people, since it's, it's quite a newer thing, people very often will not have heard about it and they'll go, what is that? And very often they'll call it musical therapy um, and they think we just you know, schlep out a banjo and we start singing, but uh, that's not <laughs> that's not it. Although I have seen music therapists playing the banjo, but uh, you know, we we have to um, nowadays, especially with um, you know the the medical system uh, being in such uh, crisis, we really have to be accountable and show uh, that yes, you know what, this is actually working for a lot of people uh, because administrators, they want to see numbers and they want to see evidence. So there is more and more research being conducted on music therapy and, and that's definitely great and it just has been exploding in the recent years. So um, even the Cochrane um, Library you know, uh, which is basically the place to go if you want to look up a treatment, uh, if it's effective or if there's any research backing it up. Um, in their systematic uh, review of 2009, uh, they looked at music therapy for depression and they did compare music therapy with standard care. Um, however, they did notice that it was only five studies that were included because the research designs were not what they wanted because very often they want randomized uh, control trial studies, which is very difficult to do in music therapy. But and then they found that the thing the the research designs were not that great. So of course I don't want me as a clinician to say, oh, but the Cochrane Library has reviewed music therapy. That's not enough because again, you know, the studies that were included you know, we're conclusive, but they're not uh, solid. Um, there was another study that was conducted with a bigger uh, sample. As you can see, 79 people participated in it. The approach that they had for this study was psychodynamic music therapy, which is, um, you know, more the Freudian approach. They're more about um, visiting your your past and experiencing past experiences again and uh, things like that. And they 
did that through improvisation, which is a one kind of intervention we can do in music therapy. So that was one approach. You know, like I said earlier, before I started, like any other um, health profession that is uh, therapy oriented, for um, you know, psychotherapy oriented, uh, there are different branches. So one branch of music therapy is definitely psychodynamically oriented, and um, that study was relaying that. And in that study, they had really, really good qualitative results. And um, they found that uh, music therapy, that sessions that were one-on-one, -on -one, and it was uh, an RCT study, which is randomized controlled trial, uh, they did see that it did decrease symptoms in uh, depression and anxiety symptoms and in general functioning. Um, and Another study um, that was for older people, it was another randomized control trial that was, you know, spanning over eight weeks. And this time it was mostly listening versus improvisation where you do play an instrument and you don't follow anything that's written. You just go and have this conversation with somebody else. Um, with your instrument and you make it up as you go along. But this was listening to music and the people in this study in Chan 2012, they chose their own music, which is of course, you know, what we do. We let the people go with their preferred music. And every week the depression kept going down. Um, so of course it's dose effective. The more consistent you are with any therapeutic uh, intervention or uh, practice, you are going to see results uh, more consistently and more regularly, and they're going to come up quick, quicker also. Um, you know, a lot of um, anxiety management interventions will be about, you know, relaxation exercise and uh, progressive muscle relaxation exercise and things like that, and that again, and when you keep doing it over and over, you see and feel the effects quicker. Um, I want to talk about another approach that I am definitely more familiar with and that I use a lot. This is the branch of music therapy that you know I, I did a training in and I'm very fond of it. It's called neurologic music therapy. And uh, before I go into different you know research findings about it uh, on depression and anxiety and social interaction and mood elevation and etc., uh, I just want to say a little about it. Neurologic music therapy um, is an approach that was uh, established by Dr. Michael Tout. Colorado at Fort Collins, he uh, developed this approach and he's a neuroscientist and he's also a music therapist. So what he's done is he uh, designed interventions for very specific goals and his thing is to um, help people get more functional, whether after it's a stroke, on their gait, um, on their speech, um, rehabilitation, people living with autism and things like that. So he wants to help people become more functional and independent. So every intervention he designed, he conducted research on them and then could demonstrate with his heavy neuroscience uh, research, uh, demonstrated that they were effective. So what he could do, he actually um, got his interventions supported by the American Medical Association and all of his interventions have a code now, a, an American Medical Association code attached to them and uh, because of that those interventions can be reimbursed by insurance companies in the United States. We don't have that same system, but let me tell you, that was a major breakthrough because it was recognized by the medical community um, in the United States. So, um, neurologic music therapy, um, this was one study and that was conducted by Dr. Tout. And uh, this is for people with traumatic brain injury. It's not people living with chronic lung disease. However, uh, people who are living with a brain injury, um, you know, a, a traumatic or acquired, they are. It's chronic. It's there. It's not going to go away. 
and those people too, you know, experience a lot of uh, depression and a lot of anxiety and they feel stuck and they are not going to be able to enjoy life at some point and uh, or they're going to be stuck not enjoying life for a while or so on and so on. So uh, in this study, um, it was just four 30-minute neurologic music therapy sessions. And in the group, you know, depression, anxiety was decreased, and the emotional adjustment was increased. Um, and in the control group, um, the people who did not uh, receive neurologic music therapy session, um, they had a decreased positive effect, uh, but they did get, uh, you know, the, the control group, of course, got another kind of, of care because we, you know, that's how research is designed now. We can just, we can't not have a group have uh, some kind of, of, of treatment as usual because it's not ethical. But um, they did have an increased also emotional adjustment. So, uh, you know, music therapy in this study uh, facilitates uh, a decrease in depression and anxiety. And um, another one, this was uh, an effect on mood and anxiety uh, and depression. As you can see, this was music listening and active uh, music playing in the sessions. So at every beginning of each session to the end of each session, every week, anxiety was decreased and depression started decreasing starting at week 10 and after that started declining again. So whether you're actively making music or you're listening to music in your session for this study, that did decrease anxiety and depression in these people. Um, before I go on, before I forget, uh, while I was, you know, researching chronic lung conditions uh, and diseases, um, I, of course, did a search on music therapy and, and chronic lung disease and, and alpha-1 and COPD and all of that. And uh, I did, I forwarded it to the organizers and if some of you are interested, I've sent uh, two research findings that were done uh, that were done uh, recently and that are quite promising and um, if you're interested he can probably send you that and one of them is a master's thesis and the master's thesis is on people living with, with a chronic lung disease and playing a woodwind instrument to make it therapeutic to help people with their chronic lung disease and um, it's quite interesting. You know, yes, there, there are the emotional and, and psychological effects of living with a, a chronic disease, but what about the symptoms of the disease itself? How can we address that? So I found it interesting that there were studies that were conducted on targeting the specific dis, um, symptoms of, of the disease and not just the side effects of living with a chronic disease. Um, anyways, let's go back to this. Um, so this is uh, effective music therapy on mood and social interaction uh, with people who have an acute traumatic brain injury and stroke. In this study, what's interesting is that they had a questionnaire to self-rate their mood and then family members rating their mood and then social interaction. So overall in this study, everybody was happier with music, the family and the social interactions were better and people were just happier to be, you know, together and, and people around the patients uh, noticed that the person they loved was happier. So that made them happier. Um, and this one, um, this is interesting because it's long-term effects on singing, on mood states of people with traumatic brain injury. And these were just four guys and they had 15 sessions of singing and you're thinking, wait, you know what, I'm living with a chronic lung disease, how can I be singing? But, you know, some people are and it doesn't have to be, you know, very loud singing and sometimes it's just 
finishing a phrase or just saying the last word, but there are interventions that are out there to just start very, very, very slowly. Um, and there are people who, when they are able to sing or produce a sound, uh, they feel quite happy with themselves and they're quite motivated to keep trying. So right away, these four guys, immediately in the session, their mood would get up. And then long-term effects, they felt happier, they felt less sad, uh, they felt they had more of a purpose, they um, did not feel as confused or tense or fatigued or they weren't afraid. So as, as you know, when, when we listen to music that we enjoy, sometimes our foot just starts. And music is so pervasive in our lives that sometimes we don't even pay attention to what it does to us uh, exactly anymore because it's just there and we take it for granted. But, uh, you know, take music away for two days and maybe you'd start noticing that, wait, uh, my environment is quite silent and I'm not enjoying it. <laughs> um, and this is another kind of intervention that we do, uh, songwriting and composition, whether it's just composition of for just instruments or composition uh, with voice and instruments. Um, this is for working on emotional and physical well-being, and that was conducted with teenage boys. You know, they were in an institution, and they were really stressed of being in the hospital, and of course that brought depression. You know, they, they with music, uh, after writing their songs, they felt better about themselves, they had a higher self-esteem, and they emotionally they just felt better. Um, so emotionally, music can have a great, great, great impact. Um, so why does music therapy work? Why is music um, so potent <laughs> in therapy? So this is um, good old Bob Mark. The thing he says is one good thing about music is when it hits you, you feel no pain. And uh, related to that, there are studies right now that are showing that music is often used now in hospital to um, assist in pain management because what they found is that when they're using music they don't need medication for pain management as much as they do without music. So what does that do? It costs less money to the hospital. So they like that and people get discharged earlier and they like that too because again it's less money. So administra administrators love that so guess what? They are keeping their music therapists on staff. Um, so basically what's happening as you can see there's the word serotonin in there and, and that's an, a very um, potent neurotransmitter in our brain and, and it and it's, um, you know, I don't want to go too deep into the, the brain thing, but it's definitely a reward and happy hormone that we do secrete. <laughs> so music involves, you know, a very physical part. Even if you're just listening, when you're listening, sometimes you move a little to the music or you tap your foot, and it's active doing. And then it's very often relational. You have relations with some kind of music or some kind of song maybe sometimes there's someone with you or it reminds you of someone and aesthetically it's very pre uh, pleasing you know it's an art form and all of that together you know makes it again very powerful um, so how it works in more detail this was a study that was conducted with people uh, living with Alzheimer's disease and you you have all your your fancy words there again that are you know uh, hormones and neurotransmitters um, that are, that get secreted with uh, music, and the the second bullet point, the norepinephrine and epinephrine, are your um, your they're your natural uh, heroin, <laughs> in the sense that you know you're secreting your 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 feel good stuff in your brain, and uh, the third bullet bullet point, prolactin and serotonin, again, they're those hormones that are all about, you know, feeling happy, 
uh, reward in the reward place of your brains and prolactin is uh, a hormone that's associated with uh, creating bonds with people. Uh, and melatonin, the last bullet point, is one that's associated with you know sleep and feeling calm. So all of that was found to be going on with music. So these are references um, about you know of some of the research that I covered. I did uh, want to make it uh, quite academic in a way just to, to show that there's definitely big support and evidence behind music therapy and now the time that we have we can make it more um, about different experiences and if you have questions about you know the uh, applications of it and uh, where you can find a music therapist and things like that you know, please go ahead. I'm I'm happy to answer questions that that can come in. Elizabeth, we uh, yes. we were actually hoping uh, one of, I guess one one person is hoping that you can demonstrate an instrument, maybe something that you have available that you can show us. Okay, since your um, participants are uh, living uh, or with a, a chronic lung disease um, and or their caregivers are participating um, and loved ones. This is something sometimes that I do uh, with um, <clears throat> some clients of mine who have issues with their lungs because I'm a clarinetist and, and uh, you know I talked about the master's thesis, um, the guy with playing a woodwind. Of course I don't get to the point of having my people play a woodwind instrument. Uh, although some people would argue that the recorder is one, but the recorder is not a resistant instrument. It's very easy to create a sound in it. So very often, you know, I hold the recorder and, you know, they'll make a sound and they're quite happy with it. And then I have another one because that's for me and they have theirs. And then I take my recorder and, and I play a little tune. And then they want to hear more. So I say, well, if you want to hear more, you got to play. It's your turn. So because they're so motivated, because they want to keep hearing the tune, that they really try hard to blow in the flute. And then when they get pretty comfortable with um, you know, blowing the recorder, I up it up and I have my little train whistle here and that offers more resistance because it's got these tiny little holes here and it does sound like a train <gasps> and of course when I work with kids this is super powerful and they want to keep blowing in it and then um, we go forward again and we go to something that has more resistance and I have this little thing again that people think is really funny so this is very blowing in and out and I also have a harmonica um, and sometimes I use little gazoos depending of course on the person what they are motivated by for playing even though this is a lot of work for them uh, instead of just blowing in the machine or getting them to do exercise or move a little to get their lungs working, well now it's something that they find quite fun and motivating and pleasing. So they're, they want to do it. Another thing that I use a lot is my djembe here. It's an African tall drum. I use it a lot. Um, my, my people have a drum also and we we just do some improvisation with the drum and very often I do that at the beginning of a session or at the end to do a check-in and a check-out and they're letting me know how they're feeling with their drum playing. One instrument, oh I didn't take it out, it's way over there, but it's an ocean drum and people who are quite anxious uh, really love the ocean drum. What it is, it looks like it Typically, and inside you've got beads and then when you move the drum from side to side and you tip it slowly it sounds like waves and you can control the waves as you know because you're holding it and the sound is quite soothing and it's 
you know, it's called an ocean drum because it sounds like an ocean drum. Every time I take that thing out, whether I leave it to the person to play it, and if they can't play it, I, I play it for them. To this day, I haven't had one person who just did not, <laughs> you know, who, who hasn't uh, relaxed or got calmer um, when I took it out. Uh, would humming along with uh, the fav uh, a favorite radio song be powerful enough or soothing enough for mood elevation? It's based on the person. If that person gets a lot from this and just humming to the radio and it's they feel good about doing that, sure, for, you know, for... For sure, go ahead and do it. You know, um, of course, music therapists. Our big thing is that we want to use live music as much as possible because there's the interaction with someone also, which is really important. And we can change and adapt the music readily in the moment with what's going on. But you know, if if uh, you know, having access to music therapists is difficult, and and for whatever the reason you don't have access to a music therapist or music therapy, if humming to a song on the radio is elevating your mood, great, you know, do that. <laughs> you know, I would not advise against it for sure. What benefits are there to singing for COPD patients? Have clients with lung conditions been able to find success in singing, or with singing rather? I mean, I guess we would have to define uh, success. If we're aiming at making people singers, well, probably not. Uh, but if we are getting people to produce some sounds with their vocal cords and they're quite proud of themselves and they feel really good that they did create a sound, or they were able to sing a few words depending on the person or sing a whole phrase or just hum along you know great every you know i want to stress that everybody is so different in their needs that it comes down to it's a case by case scenario and i don't want to generalize but for some people you know maybe singing will not will not do it for them and, and they're not going to want to sing in, in their music therapy session because they want to do something else. But if somebody wants to try and sing and they do want to sing, uh, you know, I would def I would personally, you know, be with my, my client and try to find ways that singing is therapeutic and does not uh, make things worse for the patient, for, the, for, for my client. Yeah, again, I don't want to draw general conclusions because it's really depending on the person who's in front of me. Okay, let's see. The next question here says, where can, uh, where can we find a therapist, a musical therapist in our location? How do we have uh, access to music therapists for, uh, for our loved ones here? So um, I was going to talk about this. I'm really happy that the question was raised. Every province or territory, I mean almost, has a music therapy association. So if you do an internet search or if you have the you know, um, yellow pages, <laughs> uh, you can look for your uh, music therapy association and very often they have a directory of their members of music therapists that are in the province and you can search for a music therapist um, by city, by name and uh, sometimes by um, populations that they work with. So you should be able to find a music therapist uh, through your provincial or territorial music therapy association. Thank you, Elizabeth. And of course, there's also the Canadian Association for Music Therapy. Uh, does Elizabeth suggest someone should sit quietly for 30 minutes to listen to quiet music, say, three times a week if they don't have access to music therapy? Will that help? Uh, well, again, it would depend on what your goal is and what you want to get from, you know, if your goal is wanting to socialize and spend more time with people, well, maybe listening to music <laughs> for 30 minutes by yourself will not achieve that. However, if you want to degree some anxiety and you want to work maybe on, on some mindfulness of be here in the moment and con connect in the moment to what's going on, 
Well, definitely listening to some kind of, of quieter music and relaxing music for 30 minutes three times a week could probably achieve that. It, it really depends on the, on the goal. And if it's to elevate your mood, then you just, you know, you can listen to music you enjoy a lot that's either upbeat or you have positive associations with. You know, as, as long as you've got your, your happy hormones and neurotransmitters firing up up there, you know, I'm all for it. I'm not sure if you mentioned this in your, in your presentation earlier, Elizabeth, but the question is about, uh, is, do you know if this is covered by OHIP? I, here's the thing, what's, what's going on right now, um, depending on where you are in the country, I know that like in, in Ontario right now, there is the, the College of Registered Psychotherapists who is grandfathering in the music therapists of Ontario. And uh, some of my colleagues have received their uh, registered psychotherapist um, accreditation, um, you know, pay for that, and others don't. Um, and but that's in Ontario, and other, um, well, OHIP is it is in Ontario, right? So yeah, but I guess also it all depends on insurance plans if you're in private. Uh, if they will cover or not music therapy, it really depends. Is is dance a part of music therapy? Uh, we sometimes we do music and movement. Um, I mean, to some extent, for sure, it can be dance. However, um, we also don't claim to be doing dance therapy because there is such a thing as dance therapy. Um, when I do movement to music, um, I will really you know, it's for motor skills, working on motor skills and coordination, and I really try to um, divide it based on the phrase of the music and have my movements work within the phrase of the music and to, you know, to work with the rhythm and subdivisions and offbeats, so things like that, but um, there is definitely interventions that do incorporate movement and music, but I would not say you know, that I do dance. Um, I prefer calling it movement to music interventions. If you have time, would you please let us hear the ocean drum? I got my ocean drum. I can show it to you first. So this is one side of it. It sounds like a typical drum. And then there's this side of it. You can see through. And then the beads are just down here. I don't know if you can... But... As you can see, as I'm moving the drum, the beads are moving. So I'm just going to stop talking. I don't know if through the microphone and the computer it's going to sound that good, but at least you can kind of have an idea. So I'll go and I'll play it for about 10, 15 seconds, okay? So even handling it and looking at the beads go on the skin, even that is a very sensory experience. So it, just holding it and, and looking at the beads and listening to the sound, the whole experience is, is quite soothing. Thank you, Elizabeth. The, uh, the person who asked the question loved it. <laughs> oh, good, good. All right. Uh... Hey, Ocean Drum. <laughs> well, even that, you know, you can go to your music store and get one. They're not super ex expensive, you know. So, you, you can ask for an ocean drum or order it online, and then you've got your drum, and and you can self self medicate. <laughs> uh, anything on yoga and music for therapy would that be applicable for smoothing out and anxiety? Uh, I guess the question is whether yoga and music. Uh, uh, combining them would 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 that help with smoothing out anxiety? You know, just just yoga by itself is very good for anxiety. You know, I'm I'm not a yoga practitioner, but uh, there were periods in my life where I did 
do some yoga, and more often than not, I had you know soft music playing in the background to kind of cut the ambient sounds. You know, that's just my experience. I don't know if there are any findings on it that music increases the the effects of yoga when targeting anxiety. I wouldn't be able to tell you. If there are no further questions, I, I can add. I can just add that uh, the National Music Therapy Conference, the Canadian National uh, Conference, is going to be um, in Waterloo this uh, spring, the last weekend of May. So if anybody is interested, it's not only for music therapists. Everybody can come and um, you know attend some of the sessions. So. You know, it's one good way to find out more about music therapy. Well, if there are no further questions for Elizabeth, uh, or if, if there are further questions, uh, rather, please direct it to Mimi McFedrin. Uh, you can email it to mimi.mcfedrin at alpha1canada.ca or call 1-888-669-4583. Uh, Elizabeth's answers for any unanswered question will be emailed to you by Mimi. Uh, this concludes our webinar today with Elizabeth Francoeur. On behalf of Alpha One Canada, mm -hmm. I would like to thank Elizabeth for taking the time to talk to us and also answer questions from our attendees. I would also like to thank all of our attendees for your participation. Alpha One Canada hopes that you have enjoyed and found the webinar helpful. And we would like to see you again at the next webinar event. So please check your emails for notifications from us for future webinars. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening.